Hello, I'm Alexa Greist, Associate Curator and R. Fraser Elliott Chair of Prints and Drawings here at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. Today I want to do a close looking to look slowly and to parse out one piece of art. But before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Ontario operates on land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the federal government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe Nation. Toronto has always been a trading center for First Nations. I would like to share my screen and show you the first image. Bear with me. Okay. So today I want to take some time here on the first day of autumn, first day of fall here in the Northern Hemisphere and talk about an etching. An etching is a print We'll get into that later, but an etching by an artist named Pietro Testa that we call the Allegory of Autumn. The artist did not give it an official title. This work was made in roughly 1642 to 44, made in Italy. Pietro Testa was born in 1611 in Lucca, Italy, and he died in Rome in 1650. Testa, unless you're someone who has spent a lot of time looking at Italian Renaissance and Baroque art, you may not have heard of Pietro Testa. He did not paint many large paintings that you would have learned about in an art history class or maybe seen on a coffee table book, but he did create a number of paintings. But what he's most famous for, at least among art historians and, and people passionate about art of this period are his prints. And the AGO was fortunate enough to acquire one of his prints recently this allegory of autumn. And here I give you, as you see on the screen, more complete information. So it says it's an etching. Uh, it's important to note that we have here the sheet size. And it's a, quite a large print, especially for this time period. You know, we're used to posters and being able to put fairly large things on our wall that we can order our own photographs quite large, but for a very long time, how large a work on paper could be, a print or a drawing was really controlled by how large a piece of paper could be made. And in the case of a print like this print, also how large the matrix, the object from which the print is made, in this case, a copper plate could be. So it's really about as big as two sheets of your standard paper, tall, and one, two and a half across. So it's a sizable work, a work you could see on the wall, fairly across the room, or you could get close and look into detail. Another thing you will note um, on any image I show is that if I'm showing an image from our museum or another institution, how the work came into the collection and when it came into the collection, that's important to know. Um, and is those of you familiar with visiting museums know is often on the wall in a label. So I like to give that information. So you always know how large something is, whether you're seeing it on your cell phone, computer or a giant um, screen in a lecture hall. This work, as I said, came into the collection in 2020, purchased in 2019. And as I said, it's by the artist Pietro Testa. He was born, as you see here in Lucca. He came to the city of Rome in 1629 seeking a career. He was not the child of an artist. He became an artist of his own volition. He was very enigmatic. We know that he was well read. How he became educated, we do not know, but we know he was well read. How do we know this? We know um, from ev the evidence left behind, from the types of works he made, the subject matter of the works he made. They reflected very complicated reading, reading that was really popular at the time among the elite and highly educated in Italy. So reading what they considered the classics, reading ancient Greek and Roman texts, whether in the original language or translated into Italian. Pietro Testa read them in Italian, we know, because we actually have his surviving notes on texts, texts by Plato, Aristotle, 
uh, who um, were ancient philosophers, text by uh, Vitruvius, who was an ancient Roman architect or wrote about architecture. And we know also because he wrote a treatise on painting. He intended to publish it, but did not publish it. So this is an artist who's thinking a lot about painting, a lot about what it means to create art, and a lot about what it means to be an artist. So as I said, he came to Rome in 1629 and he sought patrons. He made some paintings, but he was not highly successful. Um, he did though get good commissions making drawings after antiquities, after ancient sculptures made by the Romans that were around Rome and around the cities around the center. He also made drawings after famous patrons collections. That was a way for a patron to signal their virtue. So he became exposed to printmaking because some of these works were reproduced in prints. And it was a way for him to spread his fame, explore his ideas, and make money. So as noted, he died in 1650. He's an enigmatic artist, as I said. People you know, don't know that much about him. We also learn about him from biographers. In an era when you know, documents were handwritten, and often the only thing you know about an artist is the day they were born, the day they were died, maybe who they trained with. We rely, when I say we, I mean scholars who are looking and museum curators who are looking at these works on biographers, people who are writing about these artists often hundreds of years later. They're not terribly reliable. And many um, of these scholars became very interested in the fact that he died by apparent suicide in the Tiber River in Rome in 1650 and blaming that on his failure to succeed as a great painter and we'll never really know, but what we do know is what we can know from his writings and from the works of art that he made. This print, as I said, is uh, an etching. We'll talk about that. But it's large, ambitious, and it's actually one of four, the four seasons. I would like to briefly go over each one and then look at this work in particular. Here we have the allegory of spring. In this case, this um, image is of a work that is in the British Museum collection. We only have in the AGO collection the allegory of autumn. These prints are rare, partly because they are large, but also because the artist did not necessarily make many impressions of these prints during his lifetime, um, meaning they were not available for sale. But coming to this print in particular, spring, you'll see that there's an upper part and a lower part, and this is uh, fairly consistent over the series. The argument of the series made by the artist Pietro Testa is really that the quality of the universe and by the universe he's looking at what he knows and can see the earth, the moon, the sun, the stars, that these could be explained by looking at Greek and Roman mythology and looking at in particular the what we would look at the zodiac, the figures and the time passage and these are all controlled in turn by the sun. So the overarching argument is that the sun looks at reflects on humankind over the year and over the seasons and controls us, controls our behavior, our survival, our failure to thrive. And that only by appealing to our, our intellect can we push against the sort of nature of our base desires, our desire to be warm, to be fed, to be clothed, those are important. But the artist is arguing that we have to be aware of this and that one can move beyond it and seek a higher moral life. In spring, coming from the left up in the upper register, you see horses and a figure, and that is Apollo, the sun god, on his uh, horse-drawn chariot moving across the sky. This is spring. Um, so we see next a female figure. That figure is Venus, the goddess of love, with Cupid, her assistant, more little Cupids, Puti, as we would call them and they move across, you see a figure raining rain down. So love, fertility, growth, these are all happening here. And I would warn, as some of you may have noticed, there also may be scenes of um, maybe sexual violence, um, figures grabbing each other. So if that's something you find disturbing, feel free to not look closely at the image. Um, but it is talking about love, both carnal and, and spiritual as you move through a landscape that is, is verdant and growing. I mentioned the sun, the sun god, and we'll see the sun god over and over. One detail I'd like to point out is that Pietro Testa, as I mentioned, highly intellectual artist, 
He pays attention and throughout these four prints, the sun falls on the figures, the light falls on the figures in a way that reflects the way the sun would shine at the height of each season. And the way that I look at this, when I look at these prints to remind myself and sort of check my thinking is to look at maybe the underside of a foot, the underside of a leg, the underside of a figure, this figure here waking up in the spring with a big yawn, looking at where the shadows fall from their body. As we move to the allegory of summer, this is in the British Museum collection, you see the sunlight is really right above and in the center, Apollo, surrounded by a large sun, hot sun, a sun that is in the prime. Oh God, my phone is ringing, stop that. Um, we have a figure of Juno and the peacock and there's a rainbow in Juno's hand. She's starting to squeeze a little bit of rain. So the summer, not just a, a glorious warm growing season, is also a season of heat and struggle, and at this time, also a time of um, disease and pestilence. And so Apollo is drawing his sword in the hopes that he will strike down this season of hot pestilence and drought and, and save those who are suffering. As I said, Juno, a little bit of rain coming down and offering some relief. And up in the left, up in the upper register, the moon just a sliver of the moon coming, because as the sun moves through the sky, the moon, and here we come to autumn, the moon starts to gain prominence. This is the print that I wanna talk about in depth today, so I will move on and come back to it, but this is our allegory of autumn in the AGO collection. With the allegory of winter, the last in the series, we see a, a sort of different format, um, not necessarily the same arching of the, the, the figures, but we have rivers feeding clouds that then send down freezing rain. People are huddling together, huddling around, trying to stay warm as a, a figure sort of rises up and this this can fall into a larger allegory that I'll discuss as I discuss autumn but an allegory about the the artist moving through their life and moving through how they will gain fame and how they will thrive I realize I forgot to say something I want to say about summer which is that this is the only print that is dedicated to any figure when I say dedicated, an artist might dedicate a print um, to someone wealthy who would support them, a patron. And this is dedicated to someone we don't know about otherwise. His name is Giovanni de la Borgna. And the artist notes that this figure will ideally support him, the artist, as he moves through the seasons of his life. And in this case, this is summer. This is a tough moment. You see the the figure struggling and he hopes that his patron will be a friend and help him to grow and thrive in the next season, fall, a season of harvest, and help the artist as he moves into the later stages of his life. Before we look in depth at the print, um, for those of you who are not familiar, I want to talk briefly about etching. Um, etching is a printmaking technique that allows um, an artist to make more than one impression. An impression would be the, the work you see on the paper. I show here um, a copper plate by Rembrandt, who's a Dutch artist working around the same time as Pietro Testa. And um, on the left hand side is a resulting print from the copper plate. You'll notice it is in reverse. Uh, meaning that everything the artist would have done on the plate comes out the opposite way. So the artist has to think about how they want their finished work to look. On the left side of my slideshow are some modern copper plates. You could order these off of an art supply company um, right now. This shows um, what a copper plate that this was mechanically finished. It would have been more finished by hand at the time, but they really haven't changed that much. And that's a surface that for an etching then is covered with a waxy resist. And then the artist can draw just taking anything that will sort of scratch through that surface. I mean, almost like a waxy crayon, if you think about that, can scratch through. And then the entire plate is put into an acid bath 
the acid bites, so scratches away at the lines. Then the artist can cover an area that they have already scratched or drawn a figure on and continue to work the plate. And this way they can work in different levels, they can get a different degree of shading. The areas that print as black are the areas that have been drawn, scraped away, and also bitten away by the acid. They're sort of valleys that are left behind. Those hold the ink after the plate is inked, wiped almost all the ink off, it's in those scratches. And then if put under great pressure, will create a print. So that is how Pietro Testa would have made these prints. Looking at autumn. Upper register, we have signs of the zodiac. We have Apollo, once you're starting to recognize him with his horses riding across the sky. Sagittarius, the uh, centaur archer, is rising right behind him. He's kind of on his heels. In the center, the moon. The moon here sort of shading her face in great shadow. It's a bit of a battle, starting to be a battle between the sun and the moon. As you move across towards the left, the lion, that's the lion of summer on the way out. The bear, the great bear, and a figure underneath the great bear holding a torch, which from um, Vitruvius, who I mentioned earlier, the Roman, ancient Roman who wrote about architecture, who Testa would have read in an Italian translation, speaks about in the sky that there's a star that comes out before the harvest of grapes, before the harvest of grapes for winemaking. And there's a bigger star here visible. And that star actually refers to um, a patron of Testa's, a, a patron he's hoping will help him flourish, help his harvest, his artistic harvest grow. So there's a lot built in, as I'm saying, there are a lot of details. I'm coming to the center. You can't miss this, this figure here with a round belly. Um, this is a Salinas, a follower of Bacchus, Bacchus being the god of wine, coming from the left, the sunlight coming very hard and drawing long shadows of the fall, and all these figures who are carousing, but someone has fallen in this lower center towards, towards the right. This figure of Salinas that I mentioned is about to fall in the same thing, and that's a wine skin that you would have carried the wine in. We have some lovers who are drunken on the wine. We have figures making wine, but all the way to the left, we see a, a figure. It has no arms. It's actually probably a sculpture to represent a sculpture of Hercules, and that's a bringing of the winter. So this, this fall harvest scene, it's um, looking to what is coming, what we're all feeling now. If you, you look up top, there's a figure with a vase coming down a little bit of water. It ra it's raining, but then next to him is a sleeping figure enjoying the last rays of sun. So we both have the rain and the sun and the changeable weather that we experience in the fall. So I'll end actually with this image. But this print, we've ha I've had to look closely and talk, and I'm just talking about the subject matter. We could also look really closely at the lines and parse out the way the artist has made them. But today I want to look at the subject matter and, and think about fall. This print would have been owned by somebody wealthy, somebody who had read a lot of you know the same literature and these books. Uh, educated the same way the artist was, but maybe, you know, formally through a tutor um, or have gone to a university. And they would have looked at these works in their own homes, in their library. Um, these large prints could have been put on the wall, um, but any that survived would not have been because um, if they were put on the wall, they would have been destroyed. They would have been in an album where the owner would have sat taken the time to look at them, might have looked at them with their friends who would have been educated the same way. And this would have been a form of entertainment and education um, for a particular elite wealthy audience um, living in Europe at the time. But I also think that sitting and unpacking and looking in particular at the details of the way light is falling on the figures, it, it brought to me and to mind the fact that we've been staying closer to home for many months now, even if we've been going into work, um, those of us who've been able to have maybe been walking, trying to be outside more, maybe riding a bike. And as we stay closer to home, we travel less, we stay in our houses, we do fewer errands. We're, we're brought to look in mind 
things around us and notice maybe the light moving across the space you're working in or the space you're spending time in and seeing rediscovering your neighborhood rediscovering the way your window box is growing and and maybe putting more effort into that this year as that might be a pleasure that could be enjoyed so looking slowly and carefully maybe at some print that the owner had owned or now a museum collection has again and again we might start to see different things if pietro testa is an artist that has um sparked your interest because there are many layers with him and many works you, one can explore. Um, Elizabeth Cropper, Dr. Elizabeth Cropper is a scholar who has written extensively about this artist and whose work can be found in journal articles, in books, in your libraries. And feel free, and I would recommend that you explore this enigmatic artist in more detail when you have time. And I hope that you have enjoyed a little glimpse into one artist's envisioning of the seasons as we begin a new one. So thank you very much for um, looking at this print closely with me. And I look forward to exploring something again soon.